Ready? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's uh, Brown Bag Forum Lecture Forum, which is held here at the Museum of Nebraska History uh, every third Thursday. And if you'd like to find out about uh, our future speakers, uh, feel free to look at our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the funding of the filming of these lectures, and their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Now, Paul Hedren grew up in Minnesota, but he's now a Nebraskan. Paul retired from the National Park Service after a long career as ranger or superintendent at places like Promontory Summit in Utah, Fort Laramie, Fort Union, Trading Post, and most recently on the Niobrara National Scenic River located in O'Neill. However, his main historical interest has always been the 1876-77 Great Sioux War, of which he has authored a number of important works. And today, Paul will discuss his newest book, After Custer, Loss and Transformation in Sioux Country. Paul? Well, hello. Yeah, those, bright, those lights are bright. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you for, uh, for joining us this noon. I must tell you, I had the occasion to, to be in this room last spring talking about a book that was new then. And when De Deb McWilliams of the Society invited me to come over, I was delighted to do that. Uh, you know, one is always delighted to talk about one's books. She didn't divulge, and I didn't know, that that was uh, spring game day. And uh, I learned of that later, and yeah, well, I was bound to come here anyway. And, uh, but I certainly wondered whether there would be an audience uh, in front of me. My wife was coming, and she was bringing a girlfriend, and the girlfriend was bringing a daughter. So I was assured of an audience of three. But we, there were 45 people here that day. Um, We've, that about fills the room, and I signed a number of books, a good number of books afterward, and it was just a rousing success. So I guess what that says is that, that even on a, a spring game day, uh, there's room for history um, in Nebraska. Well, the book I want to talk about today for maybe the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I'll try, to, I'll try to wrap it up at around a quarter to two and then allow for uh, questions as you might have. Um, my most recent book, After Custer, as Tom identified, is really something different for me. Um, this, is my, this is my ninth book. Um, as, as Tom uh, suggests, uh, I'm rather singularly focused on my research and writing. I've had from kidhood just this enormous fascination with the Great Sioux War, that's the Custer War, um, the Rosebud, the events on the Northern Plains in the, in the 1870s, the Black Hills Gold Rush, everything attendant to, to that story. Um, I've written the big books. Um, I've written the little books. Uh, my first book um, is a Nebraska story, actually, um, the, the story of the small clash that occurred on Warbonna Creek in, in Sioux County, very northwestern corner of our state. Um, the first fight after the Little Bighorn. Um, it's a Buffalo Bill site. Um, there he, it's a small morning skirmish. Uh, he killed the only Indian, which was the only casualty that day. Honestly scalped that young Cheyenne, uh, held it aloft as soldiers rode by and proclaimed the first scalp for Custer. Uh, that was the title of the book. Um, it was a small engagement, but it was uh, an engagement of kind of really large note. Um, it was really the first thing after the Little Bighorn, and for the first time in what became a really long story of warfare, uh, the Army had done something, um, from their view, right. Well, I wrote that story. It was published in 1980. Um, it did very well for me and my press. It's my first book, you know, so you're always, they're like your children, you're always, you're always proud of these things. 
Um, the University of Nebraska Press uh, reprinted it. Um, both of those ran their courses. And uh, I had an occasion to talk with uh, your predecessor, David, about reprinting it again um, here under the auspices of the Historical Society. And uh, that occurred. Um, I had the occasion when we kind of did that deal to ask that I be allowed to rewrite it. And, uh, and uh, I was, that was conceded. I was glad to do so, you know, when you, when you especially at the, at the young moments of your writing career, you, you're not aware of things like character development and, and uh, assessment of kind of a little larger, uh, larger sort. And I was able to, to provide that in, in the new edition of that book. It's still available. I think it's still available over here. Well, I was invited by the National Park Service. And my first National Park Service career um, move was at Fort Laramie National Historic Site, my first assignment. And I was invited later to tell the story of Fort Laramie and its role in this great Sioux War. Um, that was published uh, by the University of Nebraska Press in the late 80s. Um, as I call it, that was my first big book, um, a big thing. Um, it was a wonderful project um, and, and uh, telling a story that was really quite, quite large for uh, the war and for that place. Uh, I had the occasion uh, to, to provide a, to, to write a traveler's guide to the Great Sioux War. Um, everybody knows how to find their way to Fort Laramie or to the Little Bighorn Battlefield or Fort Abraham Lincoln. I mean, those are, there's major, those are major locations and there are major signs on, on every highway in the area that get you there. But um, it's a little less easy to find a place like Warbonnet Creek. Um, or Ash Creek, or Cedar Creek, or uh, Canton Cantonment Reno in, in, central Nebraska, in central Wyoming. And uh, that was published by the, uh, by the uh, Montana Historical Society Press. And it was maybe that book that most directly put me on the course to this project, this book, after Custer. I call this my uh, epilogue to the Great Sioux War. Uh, when you're on the back roads of uh, the Northern Plains, um, I never cease to stop at every roadside marker that I'd encounter, every little, every little town or county museum that I'd see. Um, always looking for maybe something related to, to a campaign movement. But what I encountered more frequently, much more frequently, were, were, were stories about the local railroads <coughs> that came to that landscape. Um, or um, the last buffalo in such and such a county, you know, uh, the story of that one, um, or the spread of cattle into these rural northern plains counties. And it occurred to me that really all of that is in one way or another related to this story of war that I found <coughs> so interesting. And that's what set me on this course uh, to to explore, kind of to answer the question of, well, like, so what? Or what came next? What were the consequences of war? And that's what this is all about. Um, I set the stage in an opening chapter by overviewing the causes for war with the Lakotas and their allies, the Northern Cheyennes, in the mid-1870s. It, it's a story, as we know, about the Black Hills and the gold rush to the Black Hills at that time. Um, it's a story of it is a story of the Northern Pacific Railroad, which had, had, had advanced as far as Bismarck by 1873, and it surveyed into Sioux country in the early 70s, but was really stymied at Bismarck in 1873, um, an economic calamity, you know, engulfed the nation, but certainly brought that company to its knees, too. Um, this is very much the story of uh, the ultimate control of the Lakota people. Now that's the stage I set. Um, my opening chapter it overviews the war, but, uh, but in the most general way. Um, I explore Sioux country. Uh, one of my referees, um, as this thing was in the production process, uh, challenged my notion of the use of Sioux country. It's not a common term in, in the language. And, uh, I define that, you know, I said it really is the Northern Plains. It really is, it, and, and the Northern Plains really was a Sioux country by the 1850s. Um, 
the great buffalo, the northern buffalo herds in the midst of all this, and certainly it had real imprecise boundaries, and so the crows certainly laid a claim to that landscape, and the Shoshones and the Arapahoes and the Cinnaboyne and lots of other people laid a claim. But by the 1850s, by conquest, the Sioux certainly had the greatest claim on this landscape, stretching from uh, here in Nebraska, the plains of western Nebraska, northward to Canada, and from the Missouri River as it uh, cuts north-south um, in our part of the world, westward to the Rockies, uh, encompassing more or less of a five-state region. Well, all of that is the introduction to this book. For those that want, you know, kind of the real, a real, the real serious, nitty-gritty, up close and personal look at a year and a half of conflict, the story of war that I make references to in the internet. Well, that's, I'll be glad to sign this one for you too. This is the one I came and, and spoke about this spring. Um, I'm the fortunate to producer of two books this year. Uh, this one, Great Sioux War, Orders of Battle, a real minute look at, at the nature of, of that war. I proceed from kind of setting the stage to looking at the, the, the story of the generals who came west in 1877. Um, indeed, uh, Sherman, the commander of the American Army from Washington, traveled west, um, joining uh, General Terry in Chicago, coming from, from Washington by way of St. Louis, a, a home of his uh, um, occasionally. Um, traveling to St. Paul, to Duluth, to Bismarck, catching a, uh, a steamer and a river route into Sioux country. At the same time, his chief counterpart, Sheridan, Phil Sheridan, commander of the military division of the Missouri that encompassed this vast American Great Plains, coming from Chicago, passing through Omaha, joined there by General Crook, who commanded a military department, continuing west on the, on the Union Pacific to central Wyoming and then traveling overland, visiting military posts, crossing the Bighorn Mountains, passing the Bighorn Basin, so crossing the Bighorns from the west to the east. These four generals intent on seeing the landscape that their army, in their view, had conquered in the course of that war. They came west to to size up the needs of that landscape, to see, to visit military garrisons en route. Um, they saw a landscape that was literally on the verge of being opened for settlement, and they wanted to best understand what they needed to do, what the needs were for the Army to ensure the safety of that settlement. Sheridan came west as well to see the Little Bighorn. Um, his favorite cavalry commander, Custer, had been wiped out a year earlier, and he wanted to come and kind of soak up that landscape and, and come to understand how a cavalry commander, as gifted as he thought Custer was, this could occur to him. And, and he had his time on the battlefield. Well, indeed, these guys found, these generals found a landscape ready for settlement. And they set about, over the course of the next five or so years in a story I tell in the third chapter of this book on how the Army completely redeployed to ensure two things. Uh, one, um, with Indians removed from the landscape of, you know, kind of the generations preceding this time, um, they ensured that there was a military garrison at every strategic location on that Northern Plains landscape. It had not been so at the onset of the war, that the Army was very poorly arrayed <coughs> or deployed to wage such a cataclysmic, climactic war. But uh, in the mid-1870s, on the heels of that war, the Army started building with congressional concurrences military posts everywhere. They built them on the Yellowstone River. They built them in north-central Montana on the Canadian border. They built uh, Fort Meade in the Black Hills to ensure the safety of the Black Hills. They built Fort McKinney. Um, they thoroughly redeployed to ensure that the Sioux, and these are their words, could never again regain this country. Now they deployed for the, a second reason. 
One of, and, that, and that was to ensure that the Sioux, who have now become agency people, would never again leave those agencies. And so Camp Robinson becomes Fort Robinson. It's dramatically expanded. Fort Niobrara, out at today's Valentine, is founded to be the agency watchdog for the Rosebud Agency at first, Rosebud Reservation, then um, just north in South Dakota. Uh, Fort Sully is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an expanded. Fort Buford is, is state. Fort Yates is established. Um, the Army, in the next 10 years, indeed succeeded in locking up a landscape on the one hand and locking up a people on the other hand. You can make a case, a great case, and I do, uh, every historian I think that looks at this story does, that uh, one of the reasons for this Great Sioux War, the Custer War, is the building of the Northern Pacific Railroad. As I mentioned, they, um, you know, we, we demonstrated here in Nebraska, you know, kind of the, the vitality of railroads as we built the Union Pacific, or we, what we witnessed, our, our, our ancestors witnessed the, the construction of that railroad, and the, and the Kansas Pacific Railroad, a UP subsidiary building across Kansas to Denver. Well, if one major transcontinental is good, well, more are better. And uh, across the northern tier, uh, the Northern Pacific had advanced in the early 70s out of Duluth westward to Fargo, Stale, we got to Bismarck in 1873, but stopped there. It was forced to stop there by economic conditions and by the conditions of, this is Indian country. Um, the Indians resisted surveyors when they came to that, came into that country in the early 70s. With Indians moved, with Indians removed from the landscape, the Northern Pacific built. Slowly at first, it took a while for the economic condition to change in the country. Now, this was, this was, this was the time well before bailouts and support of, of the great engines of industry. Um, they believed then in a system of kind of the natural healing. You know, the country would rid itself over time of all of these, these economic conditions that had brought this despair on, and only then you know, would that new foundation exist. Well, so that's, it took a while. The NP finally spanned the Missouri in 1878 and then built west of Mandan slowly in 1878 um, and built with stride in 79 to the middle of, to the summer, the late summer of 1883. Now I tell in one of these chapters, I tell the story of, of railroad building on the plains. It really is this, it really is a marvelous story. Um, that had been perfected as the UP went west and the KP went west. Um, so they knew how to do it. The story I particularly, or the dimension I particularly add to the story is how the Army was there all along, <clears throat> just as they had been uh, in building the UP. This was, they crossed, they spanned the landscape, the, the, the Yellowstone Valley and points westward that uh, only yesterday had been Indian country um, I think they, there was this perception, there was a phantom enemy, there was a phantom tribe out there anyway. There was no surety, there were lots of people in Canada, lots of Sioux people in Canada. Um, so the army was at end of track, it worked with the graders, it was in the Thai camps in the Little Missouri Valley for four consecutive years. And I tell that story. Um, the Northern Pacific built to completion in September um, 1883 uh, on Gold Creek in western Montana, another highly successful, the second major or second transcontinental railroad. With a landscape penetrated by a railroad, a landscape that was buffalo country and Indian country, you can about imagine what came next. <clears throat> Um, I tell the story of the, of the buffalo, the northern herd. The, uh, as the Kansas Pacific particularly, and the Union Pacific to a degree, spanned buffalo country in our margins of the world, uh, the slaughter that ensued in the immediate wake was just unprecedented. The southern herd wiped out in years. 
and it was only inevitable that the same thing happened on the Northern Plains. And, um, and I tell that story um, in one of these chapters. Uh, there were some two million buffalo on the Northern Plains with that range penetrated by the Union Pacific, or Northern Pacific, made accessible by the Northern Pacific. It was truly inevitable that, particularly the hunters of the South, you know, who were so successful in their deadly enterprise, just turned their attention to the North, and that's precisely what happened. I tell the story of the slaughter of those some two million animals. Um, it's not a pretty story. Um, it's, uh, it's heroic if you're a buffalo hunter and got a good stand, and from that single stand could kill 83 or 90 or 95 animals in a single stand. I mean, you know, it's, you can't do that anymore. It's a heck of a story, but it's a deadly story. And uh, in a few, a few short years, that herd was pretty literally wiped out. In telling that story, I particularly focus on, on one individual, uh, William Templeton Hornaday. Now, he's the chief taxidermist for the Smithsonian at the time. And he surveys, uh, this is the killing of the northern buffalo herds, big news across the land. Um, there are no more. The southern herds are gone. Now, we're, now, now the northern herds going. And he surveys the collections of the Smithsonian. It's a, it's a charming the way this works. And sees them wanting, those collections wanting of buffalo specimens. And he convinces his superiors to allow him to go west to kill 100 buffalo. Well, you could. So as he says, so at least succeeding generations, when they are properly mounted on exhibit in the museum, can see what that majestic, that monarch of the prairie once looked like. Now, I mean, it's just unconscionable that, 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 that they think like that, but that was them, you know, and that, that was then, and we are now, we are here. Um, they didn't go to capture 100 animals uh, to preserve them for succeeding generations. He went to collect their skins and their bones. Well, he came west in 1886, in the spring of 1886. And uh, went to the Yellowstone Valley, um, headquartered out of uh, Miles City, and uh, had heard of buffalo that still survived, small groups that still survived north of there, northwest of there, and attempted a hunt, could kill one. He captured a calf and took it home. This is a featured thing on the lawn of the Smithsonian that summer. Um, his spring hunt a decided failure. He determined to come back, you know, there were stories enough that there still might be animals out there to kill. He came back that fall in 1886, fall of 1886, hunted for three or four more months, killed 30. Um, there were no hundred animals left to kill. When he left the landscape um, at the end of his hunt early in 1870, uh, 1887, um, there were maybe, he said, six buffalo still on the range out at least where he had been hunting. Cowboys would get them, you know, as fast as they could. What a story. Um, others came west. Um, the Natural History Museum in New York City, they sent a hunter west um, on the heels of the Hornaday hunt, and uh, he couldn't find, that hunter couldn't find a buffalo. Um, it was small news, but it was always news for just a few more years when some loner bull, you know, was killed in such and such a place. And I document some of that. And Hornaday actually is the great source for all of this, writes a really a marvelous history on uh, the destruction of the buffalo. Um, but buffalo do survive, and I, I uh, bring a, a higher note to, this, to that chapter. Uh, because there is a small herd extant still in far northern Canada, and there is a small herd that survives in Yellowstone National Park. Now, both of those herds are predated upon hard. The Yellowstone herd, according to all good sources, um, are reduced to as, as few as 20 animals before finally that slaughter, that killing stops. Um, museums have some, had some buffalo. There is that little rootstock. 
Um, our hero, Buffalo Bill, actually is one of those that, despite his start and the derivation of his name and reputation, um, had 18 animals with the Wild West and becomes one of those who is instrumental in the saving of the buffalo. So it's an interesting chapter um, <coughs> and with that kind of cycle, uh, but on an upbeat uh, note at the end, I think. Well, to a debuffaloed prairie come cattle. And those of us that uh, care about Western history, you know, this is one of those this is one of the great stories of, of the American West, the time of the, the beef bonanza, the time of the open range. It's the stuff of, it's the stuff of legend, it's the stuff of movies. Um, it could only have occurred with the removal of the buffalo. It could only have occurred with the removal of the Indians. The story I tell of the spread of the beef bonanza across the Northern Plains is, 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 is kind of location driven. The Wyoming story being just a little bit different, which I tell, being just a little different from the Montana story, which I tell, in turn just a little different from the Dakota story, which I tell. Um, this is the time of the open range. Um, the source for these cattle, as, as we know, are often most commonly Texas animals that are trailed here. It really is a marvelous story. There's foreign investment in this story. Um, there was a time in the 80s when the grass and the water were as free as the air. And the cattlemen, all they had to do in this manner of, uh, this manner of operating was to acquire that herd, barely watch over them through the season, round them up in the spring, uh, brand those calves that were attached to that branded cow, um, reduce the herd uh, to, uh, to, uh, to their, their particular desire for market, and turn those animals loose. That was the system of the open range. Enormously profitable. That's why this enormous foreign investment. This was easy money if you could afford to get into it. But nothing lasts forever. I tell, this, I tell that story. But, and, and, I, and I focus on, and this is a downside I'll get to, I focus on a couple of very interesting characters in this story um, that brought a different dimension to it. Uh, one, the Marquis de Mores. This is a Frenchman, a young Frenchman. He's 24 years old. Um, he marries the daughter of a New York banker and works in dad's bank for a year. And becomes enormously fascinated with the easy money, the, pr the prospect of this enormous profit on the plains, and comes west in 1883 to the Little Missouri Valley of uh, northwestern Dakota, or western North Dakota today. Comes west to acquire a ranch, to acquire cattle, and to make money. But he brings a different dimension to the story. It's his belief, rightly driven, that uh, one of the great costs borne in by all cattlemen in the era of the open range was getting their beeves to market. They had to be rounded up, and they had to be driven to nearest railhead, and then they had to they bore the expenses of getting them usually to Chicago. They had to be offloaded periodically to be watered and fed. If they bore an expense, it was that. Still enormously profitable. The Marquis's vision was establishing a packing enterprise on the range. And using his father-in-law's money, he establishes the, he founds the town of Medora. Medora, at its founding, is a company town centered on a packing house that he builds in the town, and everything else is subordinate to and is serves the purposes of that packing house. Um, getting dressed beef to market required refrigerated cars, and he, and he inaugurates or establishes that business, the, the refrigerator, the Northern Pacific Refrigerator Car Company, um, meaning refrigerated, literally refrigerated cars, but ice houses, you know, at, at measured distances on the NP both westbound and eastbound. Um, it's, it's an enormous, it's a wonderful vision. 
You know, you wished this to succeed, but it was a dismal failure. Um, he couldn't, they couldn't acquire beef enough to serve the capacity of the packing house he built. He brought out good butchers from Chicago. They just couldn't serve it. He couldn't sell what he could cut in the Eastern marketplace. These are range cows. These are grass-fed cows. You know, no, that's, that is a different meaning to us today, but in that day, um, the norm were cows that came through a Smith or an Armour house that had been grained, we know the story, that had been grained before being introduced to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Those houses dominated the marketplace. This just didn't work. He could get his beeves there, but it was considered inferior beef. His father-in-law, uh, William von Hoffman, came west in 1886 and said, uh, son, you've, <coughs> you've spent enough of my money, and he shut it down. Uh, they boarded up the packing house. Um, it uh, survived, and, and they all walked away. Um, the packing house in its boarded state survived in Medora until uh, 1908. Uh, when it mysteriously burned. Today, you go and the chimney is still there and the boilers are still there and the Marquis de Morris is a big name in the town named for his wife, Medora von Hoffman. The best part of it is that he built a chalet, a chateau on the hill overlooking his enterprise. That got boarded up as well and it's still there. The only thing that has changed, I mean, it is still there with his stuff still on the walls, um, his furniture still in place, it's a marvelous place. The only thing, he, he left that in the, in the, in the, in the care of uh, caretakers. They drank all his French Bordeaux wine. And when you are taking a tour of the place, you go past the wine cellar and it's these hundreds of empty bottles of uh, Bordeaux wine. That's the only change that was just this marvelous place. He left, uh, he and his wife left uh, promising to come back. They had friends, they were quite the phenomenon in, in the, the Dakota, in the Dakota country and in Sioux country and they never came back, ever. Uh, but the resource is still there, it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous dimension to this story. The other character I like and I focus some attention on is, uh, is Theodore Roosevelt who comes west in 1883, just a few months after the Marquis de Morris appears in Medora. He comes west to hunt buffalo. He has this modest hunt, but falls in love with cattle, like everybody was, and buys himself a cattle herd and becomes an instant Dakota cowboy. And uh, successful enough that uh, one ranch leads to a second ranch and uh, and uh, a reasonable success. Um, he would come west, you know, he has a, his political interests in the east, so he's not a full-time rancher out west, but he's there often enough, <coughs> um, and is a revered character in, across the state. Well, the story ends on a down note, because the open range ended, for all intents and purposes, with the great die-off of 1886-87. We experienced it here in Nebraska. The entire Northern Plains experienced it. Um, the ranchers that read the, read the tea leaves, you know, just saw that this summer of 1886 is just abnormally dry. Um, the geese are flying south earlier than ever. You know, the beavers aren't uh, doing what the beavers normally do and backing up water. Um, this, we're, we're ahead, something devilish is ahead. Well, the first blizzard hit in early November 1886 and never stopped until the following March. Um, the coolies filled up, uh, the railroads stopped running, the schools closed. If you lived in that landscape, you hunkered down and you just survived. Well, if you're a free-ranging cattle, uh, cow, cow that depended on what you could, what you could uh, hoof out of the, out of the snow um, to eat, uh, you died too. The losses on the range were phenomenal in the great die off, the uh, varying from sector to sector from 30 and 40 percent to Theodore Roosevelt um, and the remnants of the Marquis herd, something like 90 percent die off 
um, and that was the mortality of varying, of varying dimension across the plains. Um, it changed everything in cattle country. Uh, the open range was declared dead after that. Um, most cattlemen came to appreciate that they didn't want to have herds, that they couldn't shelter in the winter and they couldn't feed in the winter. And there was a great demand for that landscape and uh, it was segmented in due course. It changed everything. Well, the hardest <coughs> chapter to write in this book is the story of what happened to the Indian people. Um, it's a story that, uh, that is, it was, it was tough as I outlined it and got into it. I was puzzled on how I would, how I would where I would take you, a reader. Um, it's the story of the surrenders off of, uh, you know, that end the war. Uh, most people, you know, it wasn't fought on the battlefields. It was fought, you know, in, the, in acts of total war when villages were destroyed and foodstuffs were destroyed and you were thrown to the ravages of the, of the weather and, uh, you, and faced ultimately starvation or a surrender at the agencies so that the people could be fed. That's how the war practically ended. Um, it's the story of the relocation of the people, the constant movement of the people, the Northern Cheyenne people um, who had an entitlement to, um, or to reside with their friends, the Oglalas, in and around the Red Cloud Agency by giving them, a, 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 by the terms of the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, had that condition reneged. Um, or reversed, and they were forcibly moved to the Indian Territory in the, in the late spring of 1877. Um, you, you know the story. Um, Cheyenne Autumn is that story, kind of a bad movie, but uh, you get the essence in that movie. Um, these people are forcibly relocated. Uh, they survive, barely survive, with their southern kin in central um, Indian Territory or central Oklahoma until some 300 of them determined to come back. And, uh, and they do, Little Wolf and, and uh, Dull Knife or Morning Stars people, um, get back as far as you know, the bloody trail, leaving Darlington all the way back to Nebraska and into the Sand Hills, the principal's part company, Little Wolf wanting nothing to do with whites. And Dull Knife thinking that, well, my friends are over at, uh, at the Red Cloud Agency and I want to go and join them. That was, that was my home before all this. That's what I want my home today. He's captured by the military and he's incarcerated um, at, uh, at uh, now it's Fort Robinson. Um, they only want to send him back south. And uh, there's a breakout. I mean, this is a story that just goes to hell and uh, ends so poorly, except upon the investigations of everything that was going on, the uh, connivance and the duplicity was, was unveiled. And uh, these people are ultimately allowed to stay in the North Country. And ultimately, in 1884, President Arthur establishes a reservation for them in Montana, where they are today. Well, the Sioux are moved. Some of the Sioux are moved as well. You know, they, they, are, they, are, they reside in Nebraska at a time when the Sioux Reservation is in Dakota. And that was horribly upsetting to Nebraskans. And so they are physically forced to relocate to, at first to the nearer the Missouri, the government wanted them to be Missouri. They wanted their agencies to be on the, on the, res on the river. And, uh, but they were ultimately allowed to choose um, new agencies uh, that be at first are the Red Cloud Agency um, or the Pine Ridge Agency and the Rosebud Agency, which become the Pine Ridge and Rosebud Reservations. This is the story of the killing of the great chiefs. Um, you know the story of, of the death of Crazy Horse. Spotted Tail, um, the principal chief of the Berlays, is, is murdered by one of his own in 1881. Um, Sitting Bull is, uh, is killed in the opening movements of the ghost dance. It's the story of the relentless assault on the people and on the land. Um, facing kind of a forget your past and accept Christian religion, accept education, send your children to school, even as far away as Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where their hair was shorn and they were put in, you know, white man, white, white, white kids' clothes and 
Uh, they were forbidden to speak their language. And, um, and they were introduced to agriculture and ranching. Some actually took to ranching and were provided cattle who died off in the grade die off like every other white rancher's cattle died off. It's just a tough story. And when you think it couldn't get any worse, came the news out of Nevada of, uh, of the great prospect of sing these songs and dance this dance and the white people will go away and uh, the buffalo will return, your ancestors will return and life will be okay. Now that's, when I say I didn't exactly know how I wanted to write this chapter, I wanted to take people to the brink of Wounded Knee, but I don't know that I wanted to tell the story of Wounded Knee. But ultimately you can't help but tell the story of Wounded Knee, and I give my short version of it. There are wonderful books on Wounded Knee, but I give my short version of it in here as well, because it really is, it just, the story takes you there. The story of what happened to the Lakotas, the Sioux people, and the Cheyenne people, um, it takes you straight there, and it's a tough story. It's an interesting counterpoint, I, uh, I observe, to Little Bighorn and Wounded Knee. Um, there are wonderful parallels, but then there are just these incredible differences. Um, and we know, we know the Little Bighorn Battlefield, let me tell you, it's a national park area. Um, it was a War Department uh, national cemetery from 1879 onward. Um, there's a mass grave there, there's a granite monument atop that. Um, there's visitor facilities. <coughs> Um, visited by hundreds of thousands of people annually. And then there's Wounded Knee, which uh, is, just, is just out there. Um, it's bisected by a bunch of roads. There's a mass grave there too. There's a granite monument atop that mass grave. There's some homes around. But there's no conveniences. There's nothing that welcomes you there. There's no signs. There's no interpreters. There's kind of the conventional trappings that, that we know at Little Bighorn. And I find it an interesting counterpoint. These two, these two places. Well, I end the story, <clears throat> I end the book by looking particularly at Little Bighorn and <clears throat> the evolution of that place. The army saw <clears throat> Little Bighorn, excuse me, as the monument to its sufferings and the price it paid in the settlement of the Northern Plains. I think Sheridan saw that from the very first. I think Sheridan saw that as early as his visit to that place in, in the summer in July of 1877. They, um, he, he, he launches this campaign to establish the National Cemetery there. It's just a play with the Montana story of what had been going on in the East on Civil War battlefields where the care of the Union dead was just an overriding issue. I mean, a large issue. Well, here we have a very much the same thing. He succeeds. Um, the place is, is very carefully and jealously cared for from the very earliest um, in the way the place, um, the, the way burials occur, the way the place is preserved, and the way a memorial evolves. Now, we see that place differently today. It was a memorial to the Army. It was a memorial to Custer. Um, at the earliest, and today we allow that it's a memorial to everybody, and that's just so, so righteous. I end the book by inviting readers to contemplate some of this by seeking out pieces of the you know, corners of the landscape that uh, I argue are timeless, and and I would suggest you can find them lots of places. You know, and they're. You travel in Arbola State, you travel Highway 2 <laughs> through the guts of our state westbound. And, uh, but for you and the railroad that you might see occasionally, um, you look at a landscape that's timeless. And this is, you can think of it because I do, this is Sioux country. Um, this is the way it was before it all changed. Um, you can get to you can get to places that you know as you get kind of in the proximity of the Black Hills where they loom in the in the in the distance and there's just nothing between here and there that suggests anything but this is 1850. I'm charmed by the thought. You can go to national parks. I have this you know, understandable affinity for the parks. You can go to Wind Cave National Park. <coughs> 
and, uh, and, you know, kind of, but for the road that you are driving, you know, you're looking upon a landscape that's unchanged. You're looking, you know, and there's, and there are buffalo. Best of all, you go to Theodore Roosevelt National Park and you can see it on an even grander scale. Medora's charming and it's got these cultural attributes, but that natural landscape is Sioux country. But I take you at the end to one final place. It's my favorite place in Sioux country where all of this, it just seems to me, is speaking to you. Um, it's a little place uh, west of the Missouri River, uh, west of Mobridge, South Dakota. Um, it's the grave of Sitting Bull. You get there by going, you know, crossing the river from Mobridge on Highway 12. You have to be paying attention because there's no great signing for this, but, uh, but there's a little something that tells you to turn here and go south about five miles on a little road that becomes not much of a road. And when you get there, um, there's a monument on top of Sitting Bull's bones. But I've been there many times, and, and that's, that's interesting. But when you, you look upon the river, you're captivated by the rustle of the breeze and the grass, which is almost overwhelming there. And I suggest, um, as I conclude the book, that there may be no better place in all of the Northern Plains to go and to contemplate the story of change on the Northern Plains in Sioux Country. Well, that's my story, and I ran five minutes longer than I wanted to. I would be very glad to, uh, to entertain any questions you might have. I Sir. I think there would be people, say, from the East who would be passionate about photographing a lot of these changes, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Surely some people felt compassion enough to recognize the change and, and want to preserve it through mm -hmm. photography. Mm -hmm. I mean, did that happen? There are some, yeah, of course there are. Yeah, no, there's just some really marvelous contemporary things that exist. Um, this is one of my one of my other books is is a stab at some of that. Um, uh, yes, the guys like um, Huffman, L.A. Huffman, um, who came to <clears throat> Miles City when the buffalo still roamed the prairies. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, and documented the herds before they were wiped out documents the slaughter of the herds too. So it's pretty pretty interesting stuff. So there are some really wonderful photographs that exist. Books that are collected. Well thank you very kindly. It's been fun.